Coming up, they tried for 10 years to have children and then a miracle, this couple's incredible journey to parenthood. And a special segment on Black History Month you won't want to miss. Well, welcome to 700 Club Canada. I'm so glad you joined us today. Bill, I have a question for you. How do okay. you get through times of crisis or stress or pressure? Wow, that's a really tough question, but a really good one. Um, the only thing I can think of is something I tell my athletes all the time, especially when we're in a high pressure situation, when the game really matters and it can be really frantic, a lot of emotion, a lot of energy, a lot of thoughts. And so I will call a timeout and I'll just say to them, slow it down. And what that means is that in this moment, you can't control a lot of things. Like there's a lot of things that are gonna happen that are beyond your control. But what you can do is try to slow your heart rate down, slow your mind down and focus on what you can do. Everything you've learned and everything you've leaned into to this point that got you here. And I think that applies in our spiritual life in the same way that when I'm just being bombarded by all kinds of pressures and expectations and confusion, I gotta let go of all the stuff I can't control and lean into the one who is in control and slow it down and stay focused on him for he is the answer. I, I think that's how I have had, been able to navigate this season. Yeah, that's really good, Bill, because it is a difficult time, isn't it? Hmm. Recently, I was listening to Brett Allman. He had some great advice. He said, you know, we're made up in the the in the image of God, body, right. our mind and emotions and our soul. And he said, do something every day for your body do something every day for your mind, for your emotions, and do something every day for your soul. Well, in order to do that, you got to slow it down. you got to be still. You've got to take the time. And I think that's really good advice for today. And our theme of the show is be still and know. So we encourage you, lean in and listen to what we're going to talk about today. It'll really help you. Yes. And so up next, God answers a mother's desperate prayer. On the way to the doctor's office, Brandon was very, very lethargic not responding, wasn't hungry, and it was past feeding time, wasn't crying. And about halfway on the ride, he really did begin to turn blue and very lifeless in my arms, very limp. And that's when I knew we were in trouble. He was born on a Saturday night. We were in the hospital um, all day Saturday, Sunday. Afternoon, they sent us home. And on Monday morning, when my mom went to change Brandon's diaper, there was blood in his diaper. And I knew it wasn't normal, but I wasn't extremely, extremely alarmed. But then the next diaper, there was a little more. So she told me we better call the doctor. The doctor immediately sent them to the ER. My mom looked at me and she said, don't put him in the car seat. You need to hold him. You need to make sure you try your best to keep him alert. And I said, well, he hasn't been alert in hours. And she said, I know. She says, just blow in his face, pat on his cheeks. So all the way to the hospital, I did that. He did nothing. And about halfway on the ride, he really did begin to turn blue and very lifeless in my arms, very limp. And that's when I knew we were in trouble. She called me while they were on the way to the hospital and I met them there. I just found myself running into the open hospital with my lifeless baby in my arms, screaming, my baby's not breathing, help me, help me, my baby's not breathing. There was this lady that just appeared to the left side of me, and she said, honey, let me help you. And she took Brandon, and the next thing I know, she's literally pushing in on his chest and doing different things. She radioed ahead. People came and joined her, doctors, nurses. That nurse was the first miracle, because she was the head of the neonatal intensive care, so she knew exactly where to take him, what to do. They laid him on a hospital bed, put a needle in about this size, and Brandon didn't even flinch. They put that in the back as like a spinal tap type thing, I guess. No reaction whatsoever, not even a reflex. About that time is when Brian arrived at the hospital and I remember telling him, he's gone, our baby's gone. We've lost our baby. The doctors ran extensive tests on Brandon for 12 long hours. They needed to test all of his vitals. They needed to test his breathing, his heart. And then after that time period is when they came back and they said, Brandon quit breathing 64 times in the 12 hour time period. 
we're not sure what's going on, but there's something going on here. I remember my dad crying and hugging me, and he said, we're going to pray, we're going to believe, and God is going to heal him. Brandon stayed in intensive care for several days. The doctors didn't know what was wrong or what to do. We couldn't hold him. We couldn't touch him. Just He was with wires and in a big incubator and lights and everything, and he just laying there, and he still seemed very lifeless to me the first couple of times that we saw him. I wanted him to know who we were. I wanted him to recognize my voice if he couldn't recognize my touch. So I remember speaking to him, and I kept telling him, Brandon, fight, fight. You got to be my little fighter. You're going to make it. It was about the third day. She finally let me hold him. I sat in that rocking chair, and I was saying to him as much as I could and loved on him and, and just reminded him how much we loved him and how much we were praying and that God was going to heal him. The doctors never really could pinpoint and give us a name for what had happened or any real explanation, but they felt like we should expect, at the least, slow developmental skills. And they said time would only tell whether or not he was gonna be normal brain-wise just because he had lost oxygen and quit breathing so many times. It was a terrible feeling knowing, you know, that he could be handicapped, mentally ill, that we just stood on God's word. Once I knew God allowed him to live, we trusted, we believed, and we just declared that he was gonna be normal in every way. After about a week being in the hospital with Brandon, uh, we were finally released to take him home, but we went home with heart monitors and a breathing machine, and they stated that that would probably last for at least two years of his life, especially for the first year. Just learning how to put those leads on every night in the right place, I remember, was very tedious. And then you'd get him all settled and get him, we'd go to bed. And I remember those leads would go off and you'd jump up out of your skin thinking he's quit breathing. And we had to have him on those machines for the first couple of weeks, every day, all day long. Only could take him off to bathe him. Then we went back to the doctor for a couple of weeks checkup. And they told us we could kind of taper down and only have him on when he was asleep. We came up on Labor Day weekend and my dad called and he wanted us to come home for the weekend. Karen and Brian didn't want to make the two and a half hour trip with Brandon with all of his medical gear, but her father persisted. And we went and we spent the weekend with my dad and he watched each night as we would have to put all the leads on and the wires and the machines and lay him in the crib and let him just fall asleep and tore my dad up, came back home. A few days after we got home, my dad called me. He said, I want you to take Brandon back to the doctor. God is healing your baby, and he's gonna come off of all that stuff. The doctors ran more tests, and Brandon seemed fine. The readouts gave him a clean bill of health. Continued to pray about it, and we took him off of everything. And Brandon's never been on those machines again. Looking back, he was just a total miracle. I want them to look at Brandon's story and believe that if God can heal Brandon, God can heal their child too. And never relieve the doctor's report, but if you stand up and you declare, God is my strength, and God is the healer. God will meet you at the point of your needs, and He will heal your child, and He will be with you and walk this path with you. So I want to ask you a question. Uh, what do you do when you are overwhelmed? We kind of started uh, today with that question, but I'm reminded that in the Bible, we are told to cast our anxieties or our cares on Him because He cares for you. Now, I got thinking about that because it's one of those things that is easy to read, but how do you actually do that? And, and I got thinking about casting. So it says to cast your cares or your anxieties on him. And so I, my first thought was like a fisherman, you know, you cast your line, but that didn't work because you reel it back in. And so I actually looked into the original language and it literally means to throw as in a stone into a pond. Now, I don't know if you ever thought about that. You know, if you have a, a bunch of stones or rocks, they can get really heavy. At first you can hold them, but they get really heavy. So the Bible says with all your anxieties and burdens, and maybe you're carrying a lot right now. Maybe you feel overwhelmed. Maybe it's actually crushing you. The Bible says that the best way to take care of that is to actually cast them like stones into a lake. And what happens when you throw a stone into a lake? It disappears. It is gone. It is no longer on you or weighing you down. But there's this really interesting preposition. It says, on him. You don't just throw your cares, because I think here's what happens, right? 
a lot of us dump our cares, our anxieties on those around us. <laughs> and we all know what that's like and what actually, sometimes that actually elevates the anxiety because then they throw their rocks back at us and we're just throwing rocks at each other. So the Bible says, listen, with all your worries, all your anxieties, all your cares, throw them to him, let him take them and then believe he's got it. It's gone. You don't have to carry it anymore. And so today, my encouragement to you is with all the things that you're going through, cast your anxieties, your cares on him. Why? Because he cares for you. He cares for you. And so if you need prayer for anything, we'd love to pray with you today. Why not call us at 1-855-759-0700? And we'd love to put a pamphlet in your hand to entitled, Can I Be Healed? Now, next, we're going to hear a story of how faith and perseverance brought about a miracle. What is an estate plan, and do I need it? An estate plan ensures your stuff will be distributed in the best, most tax-efficient way. We plan so many other things. Why don't we plan our wills? Creating a plan for your will ensures that you have taken into account any tax implications, discussed options for the best way to pass on your stuff, thought about who would be the best executor, and considered your specific situation. 700 Club Canada has partnered with Advisors with Purpose to help you create a personal estate plan. Their services are free, confidential, and no one will sell you anything. Contact Advisors with Purpose today at plan at advisorswithpurpose.ca. And so one of the gifts God has given us in order to be still and know that he is God is the gift of prayer. And so we just want to take a few moments to really dig into this discipline, this spiritual discipline of prayer. And so we, some of you presented prayer requests, and we want to do that with you together. We're encouraging you to pray with us right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, you know, thank you for sending your prayer requests to us. Some of you have sent them through social media on Facebook or right directly to our website, 700club.ca. But please send us your requests and we'd love to pray for you. Jenny said, please pray for my daughter to be healed of breast cancer. Yeah. And Darlene asked us to pray for Alfredello, who is recovering from COVID-19. And so why don't we just do that for a moment here, Lori, mm -hmm. uh, pray. Why don't you lead us? All right. Well, Father, thank you for the privilege that we have of praying, of coming to you. You say, ask for anything. We never have to hesitate to run to our Heavenly Father. And I just bring now Jenny's request. I pray for her daughter to be healed of breast cancer in Jesus' name. Would she know your presence? Would she experience your healing? I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Yes, and for Alfredello, God, uh, for many of those who he represents who are recovering or battling with COVID-19, thank you that you are greater than any disease, you are greater than any pandemic, and so we pray for total victory and healing and recovery in his life and all those who are being impacted in this very difficult time. We do cast our cares on you, believing that you care for us. Thank you for that assurance in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Amen. People would ask the question, when are you guys gonna have kids? And it would just be almost like a dagger. They have no idea of the burning desire that you truly have to be a mom. When Celeste and Terry Marshall married in 2001, they were eager to start a family. But after a year and a half, they still weren't pregnant. Celeste saw a fertility specialist where she learned she had polyps, fibroids, and endometriosis on her uterus and needed surgery. Her surgeon, Dr. Michael Randell, said she could expect good news. Not being able to get pregnant can be due to myriad factors. Whenever you have surgery, right after surgery, your chances are significantly improved. Celeste believed her best chances were through prayer. We were at a church service, and there was a visiting evangelist that was at our church. And God spoke to me clear in my spirit. He told me I'd have a son one day. And he gave me the name Simeon. When I looked up Simeon in the Bible, it meant that God had heard. So I knew that God had heard my prayer. Every single month, I just anticipated and could not wait to possibly be able to take a pregnancy test because I was late or maybe I thought I was having some symptoms. Then the months turned to years. 
she would bring it up to me, you know, just like, man, what is going on? What's wrong with us? But I was just like, hey, just be patient. I mean, when, when, when he's ready, it's going to happen. You know, until then, let's just carry on with life. I began to get very frustrated as a woman. The one thing that you feel like God has created you to do, you're not able to do or you're being told that you can't and you start feeling kind of inadequate. I was always wondering like, okay, if we didn't have a kid, would she, would she feel whole? Would she feel complete? The Marshalls considered in vitro an adoption, but felt neither was God's plan for them. Then in 2009, Celeste had to undergo surgery to remove more polyps. Now approaching 40, her prayers had become desperate. Each year, as I'm fasting and praying, I'm just like, God, if, if I didn't hear from you or if this isn't your will for me, then remove the desire. And if anything, you know, the passion just grew even greater to be a mom and that desire just continued to grow and grow. But as my desire grew, my faith started dwindling because so much time was passing. Even as her faith waned, Celeste found hope in the Bible. One scripture stood out to her. I felt like that's what was happening to me. And it's not that I didn't believe that it would happen, but my faith just started dwindling literally to that size. And as a reminder that that's still enough for God to do the miraculous in your life, I taped it on my bathroom mirror so that every single day I would see it. Then in 2012, Celeste began having intense pains in her side. Her doctor recommended surgery to remove her left ovary and fallopian tube. It would eliminate the pain, but cut her chances of getting pregnant in half. I was completely broken, devastated. It was just like a dagger. But I immediately thought about the promise that God had given me, and I knew that my body had to be whole in order for him to fulfill that promise and for there to be any chance. Terry felt she should have the surgery to prevent future health problems. My whole concern at that point was just her well-being. Like I used to tell her, you know, I don't know what it's like to have a kid, but I know what it's like to have a wife. Celeste, who was now 40, agreed to the surgery. But as the date approached, she grew more anxious. Two days before the procedure, she reached out to God one more time. I was still very emotional about it. And that Wednesday night, December 12th, 2012, I went to church completely broken. And I told God, I said, I cannot and will not leave this sanctuary until I hear from you about what I'm supposed to do. And I just cried the entire service. At the very end of the service, Pastor yelled out, be still. And when he did, my tears literally turned into tears of joy. And I felt like that is what God had given me was to be still regarding that surgery. The next morning, she canceled it. A couple of days after Christmas, she missed her period and decided to take a pregnancy test she had in her desk at work. When I saw the positive, I completely lost my mind in it. <laughs> and I yelled and screamed out to a coworker to um, come into the bathroom. And I mean, that's just so weird, but that's just where my mind was. I was just completely gone at that point. And she saw that test and just screamed with me and we were yelling and hugging each other. Celeste had always dreamed of telling Terry she was pregnant at Christmas time, which was also his birthday. That day, her dream came true. She hollered out she was pregnant. First, first thing I'm on my mind, how did that happen? What happened? How did, how, what happened? I just could not believe it. I couldn't. It was just unbelievable to me, but it was my God doing exactly what he said he was going to do. A few months later, an ultrasound showed what Celeste already knew they were having a boy. When you get to 40, your chances of conceiving are significantly diminished, not zero, but decreased. And in her situation, the fact that she was able to conceive without any of the assistant is likely to really be that miracle. She had a healthy pregnancy, and on August 21st, 2013, Terry Simeon Marshall came into the world. There was just this fullness, not only in my heart, but in my spirit. 
he's like my little bud now, you know. He just, you know, generally anything I do, it's like he's pretty much right there in my back pocket. It has just done more to my faith than anything because even from the time that I got the promise and maybe my faith, again, dwindling down to that the size of a mustard seed, nothing is impossible with God. And Simeon, they're both part of the Christmas story in the Bible. And this is truly our Christmas story. Look at that sweet miracle boy. I just love this story. I thought it was so precious and nothing is impossible with God. I mean, is this not a reminder to all of us? I don't know what your impossible is, but nothing is beyond the ability of God to do. And also Celeste, I just think, I learned by watching her response in her journey that how much God loves faith. He loves it when we live out of a place of faith. And even faith the size of a mustard seed, like that's what encourages me because sometimes, I don't know about you, but sometimes I feel my life like I've only got a little bit of faith, like I'm barely holding on. Well, faith is essentially putting our confidence and trust in God. Faith is saying, this is not all about me. This is actually not all on me. I'm gonna put it all on God. And if, if you're just almost hanging on by a, a, a thin thread right now, I encourage you to put whatever your care and concern is on God. He loves faith. In fact, listen to what Hebrews 11:6 6 says. And without faith, it is impossible, impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Did you catch that? God loves faith. In fact, that's what pleases God. Celeste earnestly sought God. She went after him and she kept her faith alive while she waited. I don't know what you're facing right now, but maybe you need a little boost in your faith. Well, we've got a great resource. It's simply called Faith. But more important, if you call us right now, even 24-7, even you pick a time, you call us, we're here for you. We want to pray for you and encourage you. Call 1-855-759-0700. God loves faith. Nothing is impossible with him. Give us a call today. Up next, Bill's going to have a conversation with Pastor Chris Chase about Black History Month and all the examples of heroes that we get to learn about. Watch this. So in light of events that are happening in our world, and because this is Black History Month, Chris and I thought on behalf of 700 Club Canada, we should have a conversation about inequality and injustice. And I'm so glad we are. And you know, as I thought about it, I thought of heroes throughout history who stood up in the face of oppression and injustice, even though in many cases it cost them so much. But I also realize that there's a lot of people who aren't willing to pay the cost for that. So why do you think that is, Chris? I think it comes down to two things. It comes down to cost and comfort. Let's talk about comfort first. It's easier to say, that doesn't happen to me, or it's not my problem, or people who I've talked to who look or look like that, they've never said anything, and they've never complained about anything. Or to say, it's, just, it's not my fight, and it's easier to stay on the sidelines and watch somebody else get hurt because we don't want to get involved, because it costs something. It may cost uh, friendship, it may cost a promotion at work, it may cost being cancelled, or maybe cost being somehow now being a hero of something. Because of those sort of things, we'd rather say, you know what, I'll stay on the sidelines. Conversely though, when we are willing to be uncomfortable, when we're willing to give up the cost of time, um, because we're willing to listen to a victim, willing to listen to the oppressed, what it does is it makes us be willing to be uncomfortable. And when we're uncomfortable, we're willing to give up that cost. Cost matters, but are we willing to hold on to something because it makes us feel better? Are we willing to give up something because it makes somebody else be elevated to a place of equality where we are? That's the challenge, it's cost and comfort. Wow, that is so good. And as you were talking, I was just thinking about Jesus. Aren't you glad? Yeah. He was literally willing to give up everything for us when we were really oppressed by sin. And we, as followers of Christ, were to follow him and do the same. 
And, and one of my heroes in this area is Harriet Tubman, who we're standing here in front of her, her monument. And the reason is because she was a member of this church right here in St. Catharines, Ontario. And she took a great risk because she was a slave that had escaped and had found freedom, but she was willing to risk all of that to found the Underground Railroad and to help others find their freedom too. She became a voice, an advocate. It took a lot of courage. It could have cost her everything, especially in, in light of the Fugitive Slave Law in 1850, which said any slave that was found had to be returned, yeah. had to go back. She was willing to risk that for to be a voice for the oppressed. And that is so powerful. And we should be willing to do the same, right? Yeah, I agree. Well, you know, I love the passage in Deuteronomy where it says, you shall do what is right and good in the sight of the Lord, that it might be well with you and that you may go in and possess the good land which the Lord swore and gave to your fathers. And in light of that, we should be willing to always courageously stand up for those who are the oppressed. He founded a global ministry interviewed world leaders, was a leading presidential candidate, and he has walked with the living God. In Pat Robertson's latest book, discover the principles that guided this extraordinary life and how they can shape your future. When you become a 700 Club Canada partner, we'll send you your copy of I Have Walked with the Living God. Call now. Well, what an important conversation we've had today about being still and really knowing the presence of God in our life. And hope it's encouraged you. But Bill, I really enjoyed your conversation with Chris Chase. I, I'm learning a lot from these segments that you're doing with Chris. Yeah, he really is a great guy. And there is a lot for us to learn. And speaking of people who've learned a lot in their life, especially around the theme we've talked about today, Pat Robertson has this amazing book, I Have Walked with the Living God. And we'd love to put this into your hand. If you'd like to become a regular partner with us for $20 a month, we'd love to give you this as a gift. And you can learn from one man's incredible experiences how you can practically live in this reality that you can be still and know God. It's such a great book, uh, Bill. I'm really enjoying, I love autobiographies. I always have an autobiography in my hand. When I finish one, I always have another one to read. And I didn't know a lot of the story of Pat and a lot of the, ex the experiences that he went through, the ups and the downs, and he's very honest about that. So it's great, it's a great book. It really will keep well, you reading. And the wide range of experiences. I mean, he has done way more things than I, I even realized that he had accomplished or done in his life and the experiences. And so I think people will really be able to identify and find great faith and courage in his book. Absolutely. Everyone's life has a lesson and we all can continue to learn. So let me just remind you today, the lesson of today's show, it's found in Psalm 4610. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations and I will be exalted in the earth. And so today, whatever you're going through, whatever you're walking through, may you learn to be still and know that God's got it. He cares for you. Thank you so much for watching. Have an amazing day. To contact us, visit 700club.ca.